I'm Ross Andrews. This talk is on a, a quick introduction to 0MQ. So, so first off, what is 0MQ? Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about this. Not a lot of people know. It's used in Mongrel 2. It got really popular really fast because of uh, Zed Shaw using it there. But not a lot of, it, it's not really that well known. It's a messaging bus, which right away sounds like a weird enterprisey thing. We're all Ruby people. We don't really like enterprisey stuff. So right away, I can, you know, people start to distrust things like that. Really, it's an enterprisey idea that is made very Rails-like, very hacker-friendly. It's uh, zero broker servers. You don't need to set up any special you know, other machines to run zero MQ other than the ones that are talking to each other. And you don't need to set up any, anything else. Um, the way I like to put it is that in the SQLite manual it says SQLite is not supposed to replace Oracle. It's supposed to replace fopen. Zero MQ is not supposed to replace AMQ or any other um, enterprise messaging bus. It's supposed to replace TCP open. It's just a, it is sockets the way programmers think that sockets work. It's just a, a more stable, more reliable way to send messages back and forth between your machines. So you get things like, unlike TCP, you can ensure that, that the message is going to arrive in the order it was sent. It's going to arrive complete. It's going to arrive correct. It's not going to be corrupted in flight. And Within reason, you can actually ensure that it's going to arrive. Obviously, if the network goes down for a really long time, then it's, you know, things aren't going to happen. But um, it's actually, it can recover from minor network blips and things like that. Uh, so the next question is, OK, I already have a TCP library. It's called TCP. What does 0MQ give me? Why do I want to use it? And the answer is scalability. Um, you know, Rails people super obsessed with scalability. But this is scalability of a different kind. Most of the time we talk about scalability, we're talking about performance. Scalability means serve more requests faster. Um, so your app uses, le uses less memory, or it can handle more users, or whatever. That's scalability. But the thing is that you're not always just in fact, you're hardly ever just growing in performance requirements. You hire more people. You have more features. You have more special cases in your data or whatever. You also need to deal with complexity scaling. So 0MQ handles that kind of scalability. As your application code gets larger, 0MQ gives you a really sharp knife to cut it apart and to make your code easier to follow, easier to understand, just easier to architect. It lets you not just handle your user base getting bigger, your traffic getting bigger, but also handle your code getting bigger, which is kind of why we use Ruby to begin with, right? You know, that's why people move from Java to Ruby. It's because Java doesn't handle huge code bases as well. In fact, Java, you, you get, it, with Java, your code base gets more complicated faster than with Ruby. And with a normal Rails architecture, your, your code base gets more complicated faster than with a zero MQified, how it wants you to do it architecture. So it has a certain model that if you're going to use zero MQ and you're going to get the most out of it, you probably want to, to start thinking this way. Um, this is, it's called the actor model. Um, it's kind of the same thing as service oriented architecture. The idea is that you have little tiny self-contained pieces, and all they do is pass messages around. They have no state. So if one of them dies, you just spawn another one. If you have more traffic now, you just spawn 15 more of them. Um, you're supposed to use actors for everything, and use zero MQ to have the actors talk to each other. 
Um, so what you do is places where you'd have background jobs or whatever in Rails, you break those off into their own processes running on their own slices or you know, just off in their own little world. And instead of adding a thing to a table and having a background job once an hour pick it up, you send a thing off in a zero queue socket, get a reply, and that thing just waits there and does, the, does whatever its process is all the time. So small pieces loosely joined is the model. Which is how you should be writing your code anyway, right? You're, you know, little encapsulated classes, encapsulated functions. You're just doing it on a larger scale now. You know, just encapsulated processes. ZeroMQ is a set of tools, it, it's a set of patterns to help you more easily and better visualize and organize that kind of application. So small pieces loosely joined with ZeroMQ. The, way, the best way to design this is to get everyone in a room with a giant whiteboard, design what everything has to do, you know, the entire architecture, what all the actors are going to be, how they're going to talk to each other, what kind of messages they're going to send, and then just fill in the blanks. If you do it right, then each thing is really easy to mock up what it's talking to, and yeah. I want to spend a couple minutes going over what ZeroMQ is not, because there's kind of a misconception about this that the classic question is, how do I write an HTTP server in 0MQ? Um, you can't. It's, it's opinionated software in one way, but not in another. It doesn't care what you're sending over in the messages. As far as it's concerned, the messages are just link-specified buffers of bytes. But it does care how it sends it over the network. So a 0MQ socket can only talk to another 0MQ socket. You can't have a 0MQ socket listen on port 80 for an HTTP request. Um, so you, you can't write a web server in 0MQ. But you can, tr you can write a thing that listens on HTTP, you know, listens on port 80 for HTTP, and then translates that request into a 0MQ message that it sends off on a different socket and then gets a reply back and sends it back to the client. That's exactly how Mongrel 2 works. So you have, you know, again, an actor. It receives a message from the outside world and then translates that into another message that it sends off to the rest of your app. So that architecture works if you want to actually write, any, write a web server in it. So now I'm going to go over a little bit. Um, the rest of the talk, we're going to first go over how to install it for just a few minutes, and then we're going to do two example programs. Uh, one is a request reply socket program, and one is a uh, publish subscribe socket program. And then just go over a couple more concepts that uh, ZeroMQ provides you, and then uh, break for questions. So, to install it, there's a Ruby gem. Um, it's, ZeroMQ is a C library, but it has a binding for everything you can think of. There, you know, every language that you will probably ever need to use has a 0MQ library for it. And the, the API is about six functions, and it's the same across every language. So you can just install the C library. If you're on a Mac, just use brew install ZMQ, and then install the gem, gem install ZMQ. Uh, the only exception to this, if you care, which looking out there you probably don't, is it's a little dodgy on Windows. Um, Windows doesn't act the same way. It, it's a Unix library, and so Windows doesn't act the same way as Unix in a lot of ways, and so it, some things just don't work the same way or just don't work at all. But the important stuff does. It works across different transport layers. You can send your messages with the same exact interface over TCP <laughs> sockets, over Unix pipes, or just within the same process to have threads talking to each other for, um, you know, with, with an in-proc transport. But having said that, IPC doesn't work on Windows because Windows has a different model of IPC. It doesn't use POSIX IPC. So no one's yet written a way to make 0MQ talk IPC at Windows. And inproc acts a little differently because inproc, um, it, requires, it, it requires you to, to bind to a port before you can connect to it and some things like that. So in reality, you're better off just using TCP for everything. It's fast enough you'll never even notice. It's also thread safe, but you can't share sockets between threads. 
But you shouldn't have to, because if you need your threads to share data, just send the data across as a zero MQ socket. That's what it's for. So, um, you're going to start up the first program. ZMQ has different kinds of sockets. These are architectures, they're, they're common network architectures. So the, the first one, the most common one is request reply. You send a request and you get one reply back. So like HTTP is the canonical example of this. Um, it actually enforces this, unlike just TCP or whatever. You have to receive what you can send. You have to alternate sends and receives. If you don't, then that's an error that's going to tell you. So this is the client to request packets, or to make requests and get responses. And you probably notice this is not written in Ruby. Um, I couldn't, for the life of me, get the zero MQ gem to build on this laptop. So I'm going to do the, the, the demo in not Ruby. Sorry. So first thing we do is load up the ZMQ library with ZMQ init, and then make a new socket. And it's a socket of type request. We're going to connect that to localhost port 4568. And then 10 times, we're going to send a message, uh, ping, and then a number, and then sleep for one second. The other end of this is a ZMQ server. That all it does, uh, same thing, start the socket, or start ZMQ, open a socket, bind it to that port, and then receive a message, print it out, and then send it right back. So, if I can figure out now how to. That didn't help at all. All right, bear with me a second while I arrange these windows, right? Okay. So over on this side, I'm going to do, start the server up, and then over here, exactly what it says it would do. Um, it's a really simple example. It's not that impressive, really. But here's something cool. So I'm going to stop the server and then start the client again. Now remember, the first thing the client does is connect to the server. So with ordinary TCP, this would just crash. Nothing's listening on that port, so it's not going to connect it doesn't crash. What it actually does is it sends the message and then blocks on receive because nothing has received it and sent it a response yet. <coughs> so once the server comes back to life, it figures it out just fine. So ZeroMQ is reliable in this way. If one half of the connection goes down, the other half won't even really notice until it needs to receive something from it and then it's just going to block until it gets it. The question was, um, will the same thing happen if the server dies in the middle? And the answer is, with this example, no, because you'll, it's easy to get into a state with this short example where both sockets are trying to receive, because the state of the, of the reply socket doesn't persist past stopping and restarting. But um, I'm going to do the example with the public subscribe socket. It absolutely will. And it's possible, although a little bit more complicated than I want to get into in this talk, but it's, it's possible to make a, a uh, a server that will do exactly that, that'll persist across dying. Um, so yeah, let's see if I can get back to my talk. Awesome, all right, we're left off. Okay, so try, try starting the client before the server, it doesn't even notice. Um, this is, when I said that inproc was a little bit dodgy and you shouldn't use it, this is why, because if you do this with inproc, then it will notice. 
um, in proc, for whatever reason, demands that the server started first, which is enough of a change from normal that you actually have to start synchronizing things and making sure stuff you know, starts in the right order. And that puts you, there's no real point to using zero queue at that point. You might as well just use TCP, which is more of a pain. So, or, yeah, so you just use TCP for everything. So, next one is public subscribe sockets. This is another really common pattern. You have one thing that is pushing out data. It doesn't care who's receiving it. Think like, someone posting to Twitter or an RSS feed. So you're just pushing out data and another person, another set of people is subscribing to that and getting all the messages that they care about. So this is the client for that. We've got one more step when we initialize now, you'll notice. So create, the, create a zero MQ context, open a socket and set a subscribe. The subscribe is a set of bytes that if these bytes aren't the first bytes in the message, it's not going to receive it. So you can you know, put a, a couple of bytes for what kind of message it is in the beginning of each of your messages that you're publishing. And if you, then, then the make clients only get certain subsets of what the traffic is. You can also set this to a zero length string and just get everything which is most of the time what's most useful to do. So this example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a program that makes a random zip code, so just a random five digit number, and then prints out that and a temperature. And this thing is going to subscribe to only the ones for 78701, Austin zip code, and then print them out as it receives it. So, fairly straightforward. The pub server, we do the same thing. Notice that the subscriber, even though it's the one that is producing the data, it, it's the one, it's a little bit confusing, because it's, it's the one that is producing the data, but it's still binding to the port. This is just an artifact of TCP. The subscriber is gonna have multiple things connected to it, so it can't connect, it's it has to bind. But it's a thing that trips up people sometimes. So make a random zip code, uh, make a random temperature between 50 and 120, which is pretty reasonable for this summer and then send those two things separated by a space to the client. So, pub.lua. Uh, Okay, so we're getting messages back. They're all the, the correct zip code. Now think about this a second. This thing is making random zip codes. So on average, about one out of every 100,000 messages is actually going to get received by this client. But we're getting about two messages a second. So this right away tells us zero MQ is no slouch as far as uh, performance scalability. Your app might have a performance problem, but it's probably not gonna be caused by zero MQ. It is extremely fast. It's also extremely lightweight. Um, the other thing, uh, like you were saying before, if I shut down the publisher right now, the subscriber stops, stops getting messages, but that's it. And if I start it back up, I start getting messages again. So the publisher goes down, no one really notices or cares. So public subscribe is, is more durable than request response because it's stateless. The sockets don't have any kind of, you know, it must be in the state to send or receive. Request reply, you, you've got to be, it, it enforces you to do that alternating thing. So if one of them dies, there's a chance that it's going to die in just the right state where you'll freeze yourself and deadlock. Then you could be both, right? Hmm? So with your MQ, you could be both the publisher and the subscriber. Right? <laughs> on, on different sockets, yeah. You can make as many sockets as you want. You know, one is a publisher, one's a, one's a subscriber. Yeah. So, so say again. Is the subscriber, the subscriber <laughs> um, I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. The subscriber can be durable. If the subscriber goes down, it's going to drop messages until it comes back up again. But if you do a couple of things, I'm going to get to near the end of the talk, you can make it cache the messages until it comes back up again. What happens in, you know, uh, 
very large size app where there's lots of independent transactions going between lots of processes. I have a classic thing that brings down, you know, most most systems and then Google systems in particular because of the large load bringing that to the surface. Can you repeat that so the mic can pick it up? Um, if I can parse it first. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the question is, it, it works well when you have one publisher, one subscriber. How does it work when you have lots of different kinds of traffic, lots of different publishers and subscribers talking to each other at the same time? So a, a more complicated example. And the answer is, for the very high end of complicated examples, I don't personally know. I, ha I haven't used it that long or for that, that level of complexity. For a thing with 15 or 20 sockets, we've had no problems at all. You know, we, we've been doing exactly what I'm advocating here, which is breaking every class into its own process, pretty much, you know, Erlang style, and it seems to work just great. So, okay. So this is crazy fast. Um, the trick is that it's not actually sending the messages that don't match the filter. The publisher knows what the filters are, and so it will um, only send messages if something's going to receive them. So really that entire loop, all it's doing is just calling random over and over again. The corollary to this is that publish subscribe is a little bit tricky. It can drop messages, or not really drop messages in the sense of it'll accidentally, you know, one will get lost. It'll drop messages in the sense of your program will not realize that you're not telling it to send the message. So the classic case is you open a pub socket, drop 10,000 messages on it, and close again. And the problem is, unless you wait for something to connect to that socket first as a subscriber, those messages are going to go nowhere. Zero is going to say, okay, you told me to send this, but no one's going to receive it, so done, sent, as far as you're concerned. Um, so if you actually, if it's vitally important that your message gets there, don't use pub subscribe. Use request reply and get back an act that you actually got the message. What pub subscribe is meant for is infinite streams. So, you know, the temperature example, you know, read a, a temperature from a thermometer once a minute, or how open is this valve every second, you know, is the kind of things we, we use it for. Um, that's pub subscribe. So next thing. There are other things in it. This is just a quick tour of a couple of different um, architectures that it has. So there's a whole other socket type, push-pull. This is really useful a lot um, with load balancing. The deal with this is that push sockets only send, pull sockets only receive. But a push socket can have, sorry, multiple pull sockets can connect to one push socket and you will only push to a socket if it's actively receiving, unless it's the only socket. So you make a bunch of workers, they've each got pull sockets. You make one task generator that's got a push socket. It sends out jobs and the workers in a load balanced fashion get jobs and do them. So start going slow, spawn more pull sockets. And finally, there's the pair socket. Uh, the pair socket has no restrictions or architecture at all. You can always send, you can always receive. It is just like TCP. Um, it's for when your application doesn't easily match any of these patterns. The problem is that's kind of a design smell. If your application doesn't match any of those patterns, then you may want to rethink your application. Because those three are pretty commonly and pr pretty universal design patterns for, um, for, for clusters of applications working together. And the section that you've been waiting for, durable sockets. If a subscriber goes down, it's going to drop sockets, it's going to drop messages until it comes back up. Unless you set an identity, which is just a name for a socket. If you try to connect to a socket and give it an identity, and there, a, a, another process in the past that's not running anymore has had a socket with that name, then it will have the same messages waiting in it that haven't been received yet. You can set a high watermark for how many, how many messages that it will cache at most. And you can even tell it to spool undelivered messages off to disk so that you can store gigs and gigs of unreceived messages. Um, but again, if it's really vitally important, don't use sub, pub subscribe. Use you know, 
use request reply and get an act back that you're sure you got it. Because then you have, if the network goes down for a day, if you know someone reboots your machine, then, then that identity is going to go away. Uh, one thing about, about spooling it to disk, you can't recover it back from disk. So if, if everything goes down, it can't read the spool back. Yeah, which is not that great. So if it's... So that's different than a lot of the other more, I guess, enterprise -y Yeah. MQs. Yeah. Well, the way, the, the way they do it is they've got a broker server. They've got a server sitting in the middle that all messages go to the broker and then leave from the broker to whatever the client is. This is entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no broker, no configuration. So, you know, for the five-minute setup version of a message bus, this is great. This is, you know, way better than TCP open would give you. But it's not, you know, if, you, if it's vitally important that it get there, you know, if you want to log that it got there, get a reply back. You know, you can easily do that. So the... TLDR version of this talk, too long, didn't read. If you have two things and they talk to each other, use zero MQ to have them talk to each other. If you have one thing and it does two things, break it in half and see the above. So are there any questions? Uh, is there any way you can guarantee the, the order of the messages that are received? Absolutely. So they can be the same as they were sent out? Um, it does that by default, actually. Um, if you have a single socket, all messages that are sent over a socket are received in the order they were sent. If you have multiple sockets for some reason, then the order between two sockets isn't guaranteed. But if you just have one socket and you send five messages over it, you're going to get five messages in the same order. So one nice thing over TCP. Is there, is there any way to uh, not use schooling? Perhaps use a persistent database. There's just no way to recover your messages or persist them. So the answer is, is yeah. So the question is, uh, if you spool the message off the disk, is there really just no way to recover it if everything goes down? Um, according to the guide, no. The way that it does it is, the publisher has a has a spool file on its machine, and if it tries to send a message to someone and the someone's not there yet and it, it's, it knows it's supposed to spool it, then it will spool it off the spool file. The cool thing is you, you don't have to set what the file is. It, you just tell it spool these to disk and it does it. But the bad news is that that file is probably a temporary file locked to that process or something. I don't really know how it works. But if the publisher goes down, the spool file can't be recovered according to the ZMQ guide. That's not to say that you can't do it yourself. Um, if you just want to make, you know, a thing where all ZMQ messages or, or all ZMQ operations are asynchronous. If you want to have it try to send for a tenth of a second and then if it can't, then, um, then take the message and store it yourself and then try and do that, you can easily do that. But it's not a thing the library just gives you out of the box. So I ended a little bit early. Yeah. Sorry about that. Any more questions at all? More of an observation than a general question. I've been interested in zero Q in an abstract way for a long time, but I have a really hard time finding a way to use it practically or seeing how it actually fits into my architecture. So I think that the practical examples will bring this kind of thing to Rubyus. It's just one of those things that I know that exists, I know why it's used, but for some reason that's never useful for my, my application. So that, that's, that, that, that's a great question. The, the, the observation is, is uh, there's no obvious way to integrate it into a, a Ruby app architecture. Um, so I've got a few minutes left. So um, what I would say is, if you've worked in a large Rails code base, you notice that after a while, a whole lot of stuff gets stuck in lib, right? So lib is kind of, Rails gives you a place to put everything. Lib is the place to put things that have no other place. So you end up with this kind of model where um, background, you, you have background jobs. So you need to do a thing that either takes a long time to do or takes another machine to do or something. <laughs> So you end up putting a request in a database table somewhere, and then you've got a background job that once every hour, once every day, goes in, iterates over that table, and does all the jobs. Um, Joel Spolsky wrote about this in 
four or five. He, he had a, a not very nice name for it. It's a kind of model. Um, it's not very good. Because you do things like, OK, a user signs up, and then they have to wait an hour for their confirmation email, because the thing that sends emails is on a you know, one hour background job. Or a user signs up and you know, asks for a backup of something, and they have to wait an hour for the backup to get mailed to them. So a, a, good way, a good way to start integrating with ZeroMQ would be to replace background jobs with, or re replace batch jobs, I should say, with ZeroMQ background jobs. Keep a process running at all times with a receive socket, a socket that's stuck in receive. Whenever your app needs to do something in the background, have it open a, uh, a request socket or just a, a pub socket or something, send out a message saying, here, do this, and then return a page back to the user. And then meanwhile, the background job will know to fire right then and do that thing. So that's the, the first place I would look is just anywhere you've, you've got a background job stuck in lib or whatever, you know, remove all your batch processing. Like, do you see any advantage to using this over like Redis? Because Redis, you, you, you have like, you know you have atomicity and order jobs through like, you know, LPOP and R push, right? But in, in, with, with zero and Q, it seems like you would never really need that hack and Redis already has bubble subscribe. Because, I mean, you can't just do while true and wait for data in a Rails app, really, you know? You need, you need to process the request and get on. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I mean, maybe event machine. The event machine, I think, would be great for it. The, the, the question is, um, is there any benefit to using this over Redis or Event Machine? And I was actually kind of thinking about this. I don't know a whole lot about Redis, by which I mean I don't really know anything about Redis. But the main benefit to using this is that it's entirely cross-language, cross-platform. So if your background job is not written in Ruby or not written in Rails, then Event Machine is not going to do a whole lot for you. Right. But if, if you've got a background process written in you know, C, this is great. Well, yeah, no, there's also, like Redis has all the same binding. Okay. But like this, this is great for a bit machine where you need like an hack to like do your job. It's maybe like a little bit. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, so, so he said that Redis has all the same language bindings. It's, it's just as portable across languages. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about it. I know, I was kind of thinking someone might ask us about Thrift. I don't know if Redis is anything at all like Thrift, but um, ZeroMQ, what it does, all it does is transport layer stuff. It doesn't do any kind of uh, message definition like Thrift does or, you know, Thrift is trying to replace RPC. And Redis, or not Redis, uh, ZeroMQ is just trying to replace the moving, me moving messages across parts. So it's a bunch of really low level tools. Yeah, I was just, I was just thinking about like advantages because most people here are Rails developers and there's like not really a big advantage using this over Redis. For, for a Rails app, like you're having background processes. Yeah. It's not really much of an advantage, but if you have any embedded system, like if you have like something request path routed to like Node, you know, where Node has to wait for a while and you want to get that act, then I think Zero MQ is definitely better for that. Okay. <coughs> I was going to use this with the machine. You have to get access to the local stock to get into. Uh, Sorry, I, I can't hear you. If, if you were to use this, if you use zero MQ with a vent machine, you'd have to somehow be able to register a file uh, So how, how, how would you basically do that with zero MQ? So the question is, if you use zero MQ with a vent machine, you've got to somehow register, sorry, a file You have, you have to script. register something that can be a select or e-poll or something like that. So. Um, Short answer is I don't know. If you're using ZeroMQ with Event Machine, you've got to somehow give Event Machine a file descriptor. Um, short answer is I don't know the answer. There is almost certainly a way in the C API to get the file descriptor that is backing the socket. The question is, is that file descriptor always going to be there and always going to be the same? Um, probably not. It might be worth your time to make a ZeroMQ process that just has a file descriptor on one end and a ZMQ socket on the other and just translate the messages across, like for HTTP. Okay. So maybe the form of sub-process and do a type. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, I come from a .NET background, and I'm still in .NET. There's a lot with CQRS and event sourcing, and there's a lot going on there, which gives some more information for people to, uh, 
to see those areas of how you split things apart and to and identify your bounding context and background tasks for a lot of these processes. Uh, I, I, I will say there is a uh, is ERQ wrapper.net. No, but I mean, I bet for some of these people, like, where would I split when you're talking about splitting it off? The CQRS <coughs> and the event sourcing. There's a lot of stuff in <coughs> coming from the .NET community that talks about this message brokering system and things like that for other people who, who may not be familiar with it. Unfortunately, I'm not very familiar with that. I know very little about .NET. It's yeah. unfortunate since I use it. But. It's just a method to be able to split your models and send it to different desktop systems and everything. Yeah. It's just a, it, it can be used as a way to just, you know, split things apart, just take Take complicated parts of your app and and require them to be separate from the rest of the code. Just reduce coupling. So it, it's scaling in the other way. It's, it's, it's scaling your code size instead of your, tra instead of your traffic size. So I think that's it.